Merry Krimbus, Internet. So the holiday season's here, and I've been talking about some holiday-oriented films on my channel. But so far, I haven't got the ability to talk about some of my all-time favorite holiday films. And today, I'm going to talk about one of my personal favorite holiday classics, Joe Dante's Gremlins. So if you haven't seen Gremlins yet, the first thing I'm going to say is, what are you doing with your life? Gremlins is one of my favorite films of all time. It's a holiday classic. It's just a classic in general. And it's one of the most engaging and entertaining films I've ever seen. So Gremlins tells the story of a young William Peltzer. Billy Peltzer, the most lovable character in the world who's just kind of klutzy and ridiculous and over the top. And his dad creates these horrible <laughs> inventions that never work. They all fail consistently. And he has a wonderful mom who is just supportive of her husband and who is just a, a great character in general. And his dad goes to Chinatown. And when he's in Chinatown, he's trying to pitch some of his inventions to these shops in Chinatown to, to sell to other people. And while he's out there, he finds this creature at this shop and he wants to buy it for his son for Christmas. And the owner of the shop is incredibly hesitant to give it to him, but he has this little kid there who says they don't have a lot of money for the holiday season and they need the money to get by. And the kid gives him three rules when he gives him Gizmo the Mogwai. And when he gives him to him, he says the three rules are can't feed him after midnight, don't, don't get him wet at all, and don't let him get into the sunlight or he dies. And what you're introduced to is the most cute, an adorable character of cinema history, and that's Gizmo, who is just the most adorable creature I've ever seen. Clearly the inspiration for Furby. And the film follows the antics and, <laughs> and the trouble that Billy Peltzer gets into with Gizmo and how he breaks some of these rules and the trouble that ensues is absolute insanity. So yeah, the first thing I wanna talk about in this film is performances. I love all the characters in this movie. There's something about films of this era that are just so much different than the material that's made today. You look at something like Gremlins that was made with all practical effects, made on a relatively low budget with the exception of the fact that Steven Spielberg produced it, and gave Joe Dante, who had a history of working in B-horror movies, not really putting out anything super mainstream, and made this film that was so critically loved and, and praised by the general public. And it's just really impressive to see the incredible performances he gets out of these characters. I really think that Zach Galligan does a great job as Billy Peltzer. Phoebe Cates is incredible in this movie. Dick Miller, who gives one of the most over-the-top performances as Mr. Futterman. But everyone that shows up in this movie does such a great job. You even get a cameo from Chuck Jones at one point. And it's just insane the level of performance and commitment that you get from these characters to this material. And one of my favorite characters in the film is the young Corey Feldman, who at this time period in his career was one of the most believable and talented child actors of the era. I love him in Friday the 13th Part 4. He's great in The Lost Boys. A little later in his career with The Burbs, another Joe Dante film, he, he just really does a great job at being that believable young kid in these situations. And the performances are really great. Next, I want to talk about the cinematography. This movie looks beautiful. And it's, uh, it's shot on the same back lot that Back to the Future was <laughs> shot on, which is pretty funny. But you watch this movie and the way that the cinematographer plays with lighting and shadows and how in this film, this movie was made in 2021. The gremlins would be introduced to you within the first five minutes and obviously when the rules are broken and uh, Gizmo is gets wet, that he makes a bunch of other mogwai. They all pop off his body and then they start to turn into gremlins after they eat after midnight. The thing is, as a director in 2021, someone would probably immediately show you a gremlin. You'd see it within the first five minutes of the film. In this movie, it's almost at the 45 to 50 minute mark before you see the first gremlin. And what's great is that atmosphere that the movie's creating, the suspense that it's building up, 
it really takes its time before chaos ensues and what i love about it is that leaves the last 40 minutes of the movie to just be pure unadulterated chaos and entertainment that i just feel like you don't get in a lot of movies the shadow work in this is beautiful there's a shot where Billy Peltzer's mom, when she comes into contact with the gremlins the first time and has to fight some of them off, there's a scene where she's walking through the hallway and the camera see, uh, shows a gremlin shadow on the wall and she turns around and the shadow disappears and just little things like that, so many nuances in the filmmaking that you wouldn't expect from a big budget Hollywood film, but at this time there was so much more care and concern in the filmmaking elements where now your big budget Hollywood films are all shot in a giant room with green screens everywhere. I feel like there's a lot less attention to detail with the cinematography because everything in especially like Marvel, for instance, everything is very flat. Everything's shot really wide and flat, and there's not a lot of interesting shots. Gremlins has a lot of really interesting camera work that it didn't necessarily need to convey its message and its, its plot structure, but it works really well, and it works to the film's benefit. The biggest part of this movie is the practical effects. Almost all of the stuff in this movie is done through puppeteering. And it's incredible. Some of the puppeteering moments in this, it's unbelievable to think that they were able to pull it off. Obviously, there's something with slowing the frame rate so that it works out correctly, but it just looks amazing. And it still holds up. When you watch this movie, you'd think that something like this would be incredibly dated. But similar to one of my favorite horror films of all time, John Carpenter's The Thing, when you watch movies where there's a limitation to what you can do. So in this time period, CGI really wasn't something that people were using until Spielberg made Jurassic Park and started to use CGI there. And then you have like, um, you have The Abyss uh, from James Cameron, where James Cameron, I think, was the pioneer of using CGI in the abyss. Makers weren't jumping on board to that because it was something that was gonna be incredibly expensive, it wasn't really well known, no one would know how effective it was. So you took those limitations and did what you could and made it to your advantage. So instead, you have all these puppets made of these gremlins and they all look so realistic and that their movements feel real. They do feel like creatures. They don't feel like puppets and that's what's so amazing. There's one scene, and I joked about it when I was re-watching it, that is a stop-motion scene of all the gremlins running down the street at the same time. And clearly they wanted to get them all in the same shot, and if this movie was made now, they'd all be CGI. But yeah, it's, uh, it's really well shot that the rest of the movie feels so believable with the exception of that one scene. But you have this scene at the end of the movie where the gremlins are all sitting in a movie theater watching a film together, and... It's all puppeteering work and it all looks amazing and the fact that they were able to pull off shots like that is incredibly impressive. The last thing I want to talk about is the Jerry Goldsmith score. Uh, it, it really makes this movie feel fantastical and fun and, and it really feels like you're on an adventure. And movies made in the 80s and the 90s, some of these big budget Hollywood films, you look at this, Ghostbusters, The Goonies, the Indiana Jones films even. I mean, a lot of these movies that were big budget Hollywood blockbusters that feel like you're on an adventure. They feel new and unique and, and fresh where a lot of our big budget Hollywood blockbusters now are a part of a larger franchise. So it feels like the originality stripped away a little bit more than it was in the 80s and the early 90s. Going back and revisiting these movies, I can't imagine what it would have been like seeing Gremlins in the theater. I, I can only imagine. I was born in 1990. This was before my time, but I would have loved to have been someone who could have seen this in the in the theater the weekend it was released, because it's just a fun movie, and it's a great film to watch around the holidays. It has that Christmas atmosphere. The score's great. There's this moment uh, that I absolutely love where uh, it's the scene where Billy Peltzer's mom fights the gremlins the first time, and Do You Hear What I Hear starts playing on the record player. And it's just, it, it just fits the film so well. And even though you get some moments of some really terrible fake snow, for the most part, the movie feels really realistic and it's one that I am never going to quit watching. So have you seen Gremlins? Do you love it? Do you hate it? If you hate it, you've got problems. <laughs> Leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. This is one of my favorite holiday films. I enjoy revisiting it. I just think that it is an absolute blast. And it's a film that I'm going to continue to revisit for a very, very long time. As always, if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, it helps me out a lot and lets me know the type of content you're looking for. As always, Internet, thanks so much for watching and have a great rest of your day.